Well, the, this morning's message is going to be a little bit different. You'll notice that there's no fill in the blanks in the back of your bulletin, only lines there, places for you to make your own notes. Because this morning, we're going to be dealing with a very difficult passage. It's one that's going to challenge us, and it's one that I hope will touch each one of us deeply and personally. There will be no PowerPoint slides this morning. I'll put the verses up there. You'll see those. But, but I want to provide you the opportunity to write down your own thoughts. Because this morning, I want you to join me on a journey as we go near the cross. The news has spread faster than anything else in this city. The majority of it has been done in secret, behind closed doors, the cover of darkness. And by the time daylight comes on this city, the travelers and the crowds make their way back out onto the dusty streets. There's no stopping it. It's already been set in motion. Rome already has their hand in it. And the crowds will follow just to see what's going to happen. Some will cheer. Many will take different sides. This is a day that will split time and history as we know it. Our calendars will forever be changed on this day from A.D., or from B.C., rather, to A.D. This morning we finally come to Luke chapter 23. It's a... This is a chapter that separates Christianity from every other philosophy or religion or idea. And as we saw last week, in the midst of it all, in the midst of the crowds shouting and chanting and jeering, Pilate has decided to grant the crowd's demands. He's released a man named Barabbas, the man who had been thrown in prison for insurrection and for murder. He's the one they asked to be set free. And he has turned Jesus over to their will. And we pick up the story this morning in Luke chapter 23. We'll be beginning in verse 26, and there is a lot to cover. Because we will read through the end of this chapter. Luke 23, beginning in verse 26. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon of Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put a cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. <clears throat> then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood there watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar that said, if you are the king of the Jews, <laughs> save yourself. And there was written a notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. Now, I want to stop here just for a moment because Matthew chapter 27 
gives us just a little bit more detail into what's going on. Matthew 27, verse 39, simply says this, Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, (laughs) save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and then we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. And oh, how ignorant they are. Everything they said about Jesus was absolutely true. But do you hear the sarcasm and the mockery? They yelled at him, if you really are the Messiah, if you really are the chosen one, if you really are the king of the Jews, the king of Israel, then then save yourself. And I don't want you to miss the irony because they're convinced that what they're saying is absolutely impossible. They understand there's no way that Jesus can bring himself down off of the cross. And the irony of it is they say, save yourself. And Jesus is saving them, the ones that are shouting the ones that are hurling insults at him and us, saving all of humanity from a punishment that each of us rightly deserves. But there are those people who are standing around the cross that day and they're looking up and and, and they think they know better than God how things should be done. Even the religious leaders, the ones who are so concerned about being, being uh, ceremonial clean and uh, ceremonially clean and pure they preserve themselves for the Passover they, so they follow certain rituals for this Passover celebration and yet they are killing the Lamb of God let's pick it back up in verse 39 one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him Aren't aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man's done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today, today, you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun had stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn into two. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Now, just a little side note here. The words that Jesus spoke, into your hands I commit my spirit. It actually comes from a biblical passage, Psalm 31, 5. It was a part of a common prayer that Jewish women would teach their children when they went to bed at night. It says, into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. It would be like today we would, we would teach our children, now I lay me down to sleep. It was something that they all knew and were very, very familiar with. But Jesus, Jesus makes it personal and intimate and says, Father, Jesus had finished the work that his father had set before him. And now he would taste death, fully trusting in his father's loving plan 
for you and for me. Verse 47. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts. It's a symbol of of anguish, of, of pain, of mourning, and they went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council. This would be the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it into a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. And then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. How did we get here? It has been 23 chapters of some of the most amazing stories you could ever imagine. 23 chapters of Luke saying, here's who he is and here's what he has done. It has been three years of teaching and miracles and power. The type of teaching that the crowds just can't get enough of. The type of teaching that that thousands upon thousands of people would fill an entire hillside. It's a type of teaching that wasn't about church or or religion. It was something that resonated with every man and every woman, something that finally made sense out of life. So how, how did we get here? It was just a couple of days ago that he came riding into the city in the midst of cheers and shouts. People were were throwing down palm branches ahead of him, and they were taking off their cloaks and their tunics and laying them down on the road. And as he walked over them on his his, uh, burrow, they'd pick him up and lay him down in front of him again. The The crowds were cheering, Hosanna, bring power, save now. And so how did we get here? from that scene where everyone's cheering to this scene where everyone demands his death. His followers are confused and bewildered. And everyone has the same question in their head. How did we get to this? How do you put nails into the hands that fed 5,000 out of a little kid's lunchbox? How does the same voice say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit? The same voice that spoke and the seas went calm. Jesus was crucified in a very public place, which means many people saw what was going on. And in the time that we have together this morning, I want us to go there. I want us together to stand before the cross as this horrific scene unfolds. Now, we don't know how many other people are there with us, but verse 27 says it's a large number that have followed him, including the women who mourned and wailed. Jesus was crucified just outside the city gates of Jerusalem, and we know that hundreds of thousands of people had come to the city to celebrate Passover. Tens of thousands were camped outside the city, just trying to be close. So keep this in the back of your mind. If Jesus had wanted an uprising, he would have found plenty of volunteers. In fact, we are surrounded by thousands of people. People who are there 
hopeful for an overthrow of the Roman government and hopeful that the Messiah is going to take his rightful place as their leader. His followers knew this, and his enemies knew this also. Emergency high-level meetings had been held in the cover of night at the Sanhedrin. The religious leaders had determined that it would be best if this rabbi, this high-profile dignitary, would simply be executed. It would be better for the nation. And as we look around, we see those same religious leaders that made this awful decision. Oh, they're there. They're there at the cross looking at the fruits of their labor. The presence of the chief priests is recorded by Matthew, Mark, and John. Luke doesn't mention them much, but he does tell us that the rulers, those who make up the Sanhedrin, they're there. So a multitude of people are there with us on that hill. They've just come out to see what's going to happen. Some of them are expecting that he actually will pull himself down off the cross that this is the miracle for the, the, the promised Messiah that they had been waiting for. Some have accidentally walked through the Damascus gates and, and perhaps they were surprised when they saw three crosses just outside the city and a huge crowd around them. Some had heard about the incident and wanted to see for themselves. And so they ran to the foot of the cross just to watch what was happening. Some had heard about the incident and, and, and re- decided to remain inside their homes, hiding behind curtains and looking through window coverings. Some have come out because they want to curse this convicted man as a liar and a blasphemer. And undoubtedly, some are there, driven by a sense of grief, the most intense grief they've ever known. But my question to you this morning is, where would you have fit in on that day? Would you have been the man who was trying to get to work? And he's upset because the crowd of people is blocking his road. You know how it is when we're on the freeway and there's a traffic accident. Everybody's got to stop. Not that they're going to get out and help. They just want to see what's going on. Nobody plans to stop and and do anything. But you're inconvenienced. You have to slow down. You have to take time out, maybe a detour. Is your relationship to Jesus similar to that man? Jesus is nothing more than a momentary distraction in life. It's a disruption of your regular routine, maybe Maybe an inconvenience at worst. Oh, you've heard about him. But going near him? That's the last thing on your mind. You're much too busy for things like Jesus. Or maybe, maybe you'd be like the woman who's crying and wailing at the cross. She's yelling, my son, my son, how could they do this to you? She sobs uncontrollably until her husband comes over and puts his arms around her and says, come, we we should go. I knew it was not a good idea to bring you here to see this. You see, their son is getting what he deserved. He chose a life of crime and it caught up with him because this husband and wife, they're there at the crucifixion, but not Jesus's. Their son was one of the thieves on his right or his left. Well, they saw Jesus but that's not who they were there to see. Their son meant far more to them than Jesus Christ ever could. The suffering that was going on with Jesus, it was meaningless to them. They were totally unaware of their need for Jesus in their lives, and maybe that's where you are today. You don't know, understand why Jesus was at the cross or what he was doing there. And you're much more concerned with your own problems. You're hurting, but you really don't think Jesus is the answer. He's not going to help you. And Jesus, well, he, he might be important, but your problems are much bigger than that. Or maybe, 
Maybe you're like the guy that, that he came to the cross because he heard about Jesus and some of the miracles he has done. It was just a few weeks ago that, that he took a, a, a Lazarus and raised him back from the dead. Now, you weren't there to see it, but it was pretty impressive. A lot of people are talking about it. You're not quite sure. Is this Jesus really who he claims to be? And if he could just do a miracle, if he could just do a miracle while he's up on that cross, then maybe, maybe I'll believe him then and I'll understand that he really is who he says he is. You're thinking if God would just prove himself, well, maybe, maybe you'll give him a shot. And so along with the rest of the crowd, you cheer. If you really are the son of God, do something amazing. Pull yourself down off that cross. And the problem with that thinking is that, that you don't realize how serious a matter your sin is. You're willing to bargain away your soul over proof beyond all doubt that he is who he says he is. My friends, I want you to hear me very clearly on this. Anyone who comes to the cross has to come in faith. It's the only way for the work of Christ to cleanse us from our sins. If Jesus had chosen to perform a miracle as he, as he hung on that cross, if he, if he had chosen to, to prove to everyone he was who he says he was, why, he wouldn't have died. And we'd still be lost. This is the only way that salvation comes to me and to you. If you were there at the cross on that day, I wonder if you would be like one of the soldiers. They only came to the cross because it's their job. They didn't really care about Jesus one way or the other. They had to be at the cross. When they looked at Jesus, they saw a paycheck. Jesus wasn't going to be needing his clothes, so one took his shoes, one gets his scarf, one gets his cloak. His tunic was worth more to, as one separate piece, so rather than, than splitting it up, they threw dice to see who would get it. The soldiers weren't interested in Jesus dying for their sins. They had no idea what that would mean to them. They simply wanted him dead. They were more interested in what they could get out of Jesus in this life. It is so easy for us to see Jesus as our way maker, our, the one that's gonna bless us financially. We're not interested in things like obedience or changed lives. We want Jesus to bless us. Oh, we might come to church, maybe to Bible study, not, not because we love Christ, but it's, well, it's kind of our duty. Our family expects us to go to church, or even worse, they make us go to church. And we go, like those soldiers, only looking at what's in it for me. I wonder, I wonder if Barabbas bothered to go out to the cross to see the guy that was being crucified instead of him. When Pilate offers to release a Jesus as a tradition done at the Passover, the crowd says, no, no, not Jesus, give us Barabbas. Barabbas was a known criminal, a hood, a thug. He was a murderer and an insurrectionist, and he was condemned to die. Jesus was his ticket to freedom. And I wonder if he's grateful to Jesus for dying in his place, or did he just think, you know, he was just the, the right guy in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't know, maybe Barabbas is too busy out celebrating his, his good fortune. Maybe he doesn't even care. He couldn't be bothered with going to see Jesus on that cross on that day. He knew about Jesus, but quite honestly, like people today, he just simply didn't care. Or maybe, maybe you're more like one of the disciples, one of the 12 that we know of that actually was there 
at the cross that day. The disciple John was there, and I believe John came seeking forgiveness. He knew that he had turned his back on Jesus when he needed him the most, but it didn't matter now. John was willing to, to risk whatever it took just to get close to Jesus one more time. He's close enough to see Jesus' eyes. He's close enough to hear Jesus' voice. And I just simply have to wonder, what was it like for John to look up and see Jesus beaten and swollen and hanging on a cross? It was, it was a much different picture a week ago when Jesus was riding on a donkey through the city gates. It was a much different picture even just a day or two ago when Jesus was having the Last Supper in that upper room. John came to the cross willing to do whatever Jesus required of him. His goal was simply fulfill Jesus' last request. What he says, I'm going to do. And in John 19, 26, Jesus says to John, from now on, I want you to take care of my mother just as if she was your own. And in verse 27, it says, from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. The very best reason for coming to the cross is to come with the understanding that Jesus Christ is hanging there to pay your price, taking your place and dying for your sin. God is doing what is necessary in order that we might be saved. And therefore, like John, we have to come and simply say, whatever it takes. The cross is about knowing that the journey of, that we are all on is going to end in death. The people at the cross don't know it yet, but there's going to be a resurrection. And this is definitely not the end. One of the criminals who's hanging on either the right or the left of Jesus recognizes this is the Son of God. And he realizes that Jesus coming into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, was, was, it was bringing in a new kingdom. And therefore, that new kingdom hasn't come yet. And so he turns to Jesus and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In other words, he's putting all of his hope, all of his faith, all of his trust into Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Today, you're going to be with me in paradise. So what about you? Are you there at that cross? Are you one of the people that we've seen who are also there? It is my prayer that you join me at the foot of the cross this morning and together that we meet the Savior of the world and that we are put into and restored into a right relationship with God. There were thousands of people there that day passing by or, or standing near the cross. But for every person there, what they saw well, it depended on what they were looking for. When they looked at Jesus, did they see freedom? Or was he merely an inconvenience? And as we close this morning, whoever you are, wherever you are, wherever you might be watching this, I'm going to ask that you simply pray a prayer with me this morning. And for some of you, it may be the very first time. You may have never completely given your life to Christ. And this, this is simply between you and God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, just say this simple prayer along with me. God, thanks for this life that you've given me. Thanks for loving me when I don't deserve it. And I know that your love is something I can never earn. Thanks for proving that love 
by dying on the cross for me. I could never pay that debt of my own sin. And so, Father, I thank you for the life of your Son who died in my place. And because of that, from this day on now, Father, teach me how to follow you. Teach me how to love you the way that you love me. Teach me what this new life looks like. Not from a distance. But Jesus, I ask that you just come into my life today and change me from the inside. Today, I give you my life. And if you just said that prayer with me for the first time today, I want you to message me. I want you to call me. I want you to text me. I want you to let me know. Because I want to help you get plugged in and starting on this, on this journey that's going to be literally life-changing for you. And so just let me know today that, hey, I prayed that prayer. And for the rest of us now, let's pray. Father, for the rest of us, may we be reminded each and every day the reason you came, oh, it was for us. And it was for so many people just like us. Father, we are not worthy. We are not deserving. And that is why you had to come. And God, may you find each of us faithful and obedient, standing at the foot of your cross and seeking your love and your forgiveness. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Thank you for coming this morning, and please come back next Sunday. In the meantime, go out there and find somebody who's struggling with their own faith and share some of yours with them. And God will bless you for that.